The manifestations of radiation in the body are many and range from slight to severe. Loss of hair, nausea, bleeding, inability of the body to resist other ailments and make its own repairs. These are some of them, and they may be climaxed by the ultimate symptom, death itself. However, complete recovery is more probable. The illness runs a course from causes to effects. Much of the mystery surrounding it is maintained by the general public, which is determined to regard radioactivity as potent and irresistible as the evil spirits of the Indians. This can be partly explained by man's fear of dangers he cannot sense. A fear fanned into widespread misunderstanding and by sensational speculation on what radiation can do. Radioactivity is dangerous, but to say that it's deadly, period, is as misleading as giving a flat answer to the question, how high is up? The radium-treated dial of your watch, for instance, is harmless. Nuclear emanations became a threat when man isolated such hot stuff as radium and worked intimately with it, broadening its scientific, medical, and industrial use. A threat, however, that has been effectively controlled through observing caution. Not even the atomic bomb burst, man's boldest venture in releasing atomic power, is the DDT of humanity from which there is no escape. For it has its known limits, calling for preventive measures as clear-cut as those doctors lay down in telling people how to ward off infectious diseases. The first and obvious one is, be someplace else when it happens. Distance lends considerable enchantment to an A-burst. But under some conditions, that's a hard rule to follow. Atomic warfare, for instance, might allow a little choice in the matter. So if you can't stay away from it, you must stay with it, as safely as possible and properly protected. Proper protection is based on what we know about the penetration of gamma rays and neutrons. The ability of a shielding material to stop them is expressed in half thickness. The thickness necessary to reduce the radiation's intensity one half. In dealing with gamma rays, the half thickness of a very dense material like steel is one inch. That of concrete less dense is three inches, while 12 inches of wood, which is quite porous, is required. Against neutrons, the density of a material is not so important as its ability to slow down and capture the particles. Concrete, earth, and water furnish good shielding. The best shelters, then, against the gamma and neutron bombardment released by an atomic explosion are strong reinforced structures. That prompt bombardment of a high aerial burst is severe but short-lived, since it is carried up into the stratosphere. It's safe to go into the area under the explosion about two minutes after it occurs. Not so with an underwater blast, however, and presumably in the event of underground and surface explosions. The area is contaminated with radioactive material, which gives off alpha and beta particles and gamma rays. However, the material which emits alpha and beta must be taken into the body through the mouth and nose, or skin breaks, before they can carry on with their injurious ionizing. It's the fallacy of devoting 85% of one's worrying capacity to an agent that constitutes only about 15% of 
of an atomic bomb's destroying potential. And that's on sound. Doesn't fit. If you must worry, concentrate on the blast effect of an A-bomb. It's prompt and devastating. It causes a gigantic rearrangement of things, a complete change of scenery, and means sudden death to those who chance to be in the way when it's happening. Don't forget the fires that follow. Consider the flash heat, which changes the complexion of all that it strikes. Bear in mind always that blast and heat are an A-bomb's most powerful weapon, that their lethal range is greater and their effect much quicker than the radiation. Blast and heat are hazards that warrant concern, but not panic, because they aren't new or novel. They are the same forces of World War II's conventional bombing, which some of you may have experienced, and you did all right. You're here. Some of the falsehoods circulated about radiation effects are trivial, but upsetting. They're beamed right at one's self-esteem, and will eventually result in a race of bald-headed people. Just imagine. Imagine yourself with no hair. They'll call you old skinhead, old chrome dome. And that's not all radioactivity will do. It will... Enough exposure to radiation will cause loss of hair. The treatment, if you'd insist, would be symptomatic, a toupee. But the condition would only be temporary. Your hair would come back. Same color, same cowling. A fear that is grossly built up in popular print is that radiation will cause impotence, which is the mechanical inability of a man to fulfill his sexual role. That fear won't stand examination. Another subject of misgivings is sterility. A sterile man can carry out his sexual obligations physically, but is unable to fertilize, to reproduce his kind. The estimated dose needed to bring about permanent sterility exceeds the lethal dose. So obviously, sterility by radiation would be just incidental, a matter a dead man wouldn't worry about. The public has been forced fed grave suspicion that extensive use of atomic energy, as in war, might eventually result in an overabundance of freaks, suitable for sideshow exhibitions. We can start taking the freak possibilities apart by looking at a sperm cell, the kind of cell that plays a leading part in reproduction. These chromosomes contain the material through which such physical characteristics as color of hair and eyes are handed down from parent to offspring. Sometimes the chromosomes are broken up, this upsets the heredity controlling material when the cell divides, and the result may be a mutation, a variation from the parent. It occurs naturally and may also be brought about by radiation. But radiation can't produce any new kinds of mutation. They can only increase the natural rate. Is the increase enough to stew about? No. We can't experiment along these lines with humans. But we can observe the effect of radioactivity on mice and fruit flies, which produce new generations so frequently that to study them for a short time is like reviewing a long span of mankind's history. These are the probabilities, and they aren't important enough to lose any sleep over. Besides, a mutation can be a good variation, an improvement both of the parents. If you'll be honest with yourself, face the facts you'll probably realize that your principal worry ought to be that your offspring will look just like you.